that, you know. <laughs> they are not going to be infected by your smile or good day in anything. They're going to be able to be sour regardless of what you do. <laughs> well, I've known a few people like that. Uh, at any rate, uh, happy Mother's Day. Okay, um, let's see. Oldest mom. No, it's not you. <laughs> I think I'm going to the back row back there. Uh, I, I pre You've got a few years on Jane, don't you, Jean? So, Jean, you, she has her 90th birthday party on the second Saturday of, or the first Saturday, first Saturday of June. So, oldest mom, Jean. Okay, um, longest mom might be different. Who has a, who has a, cha, a son or a daughter that's over 50? Raise your hand if it's over 50. Okay, Jane might not be hearing me, so she might have one of them running too. How old are your... 52. What's your oldest, Gene? <laughs> do we even need to do that? <laughs> really? <laughs> we don't even need to go bad further than that, do we? <laughs> okay. Longest mom also, <laughs> Gene. <laughs> how, about, how about newest mom? Who's got the youngest child? Uh, who's, who's the youngest? Katie? Well, come, yeah, well, come on, which one is it? Which one are you? Okay, so it's Katie. Okay, Katie, take a bow, stand up. You're younger, so we're going to make you stand up. First service, first service, Adam's wife was playing guitar. His wife, Teresa, was here. And we claimed her as the newest mom because she's due on, April, on uh, June 15th. So uh, I believe uh, life starts at conception, so she's got the uh, youngest kid yet to be born. So keep them in prayer, if you would, as that uh, young one comes on. I'm, I'm glad for him joining our worship team on, uh, on guitar and helping us out. Um, anyway, today uh, we're going to continue the book of Acts. We're going to meet Acts chapter 4. And, but I just want to go back a, a couple of chapters and say, there's a few verses you really need to be aware of in Acts, and I would recommend that you memorize them, uh, and I think you may have already. But the first one, I mean, it's, it's always neat as you're going through a book to say these are important verses. So Acts 1.8, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, or in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Samaria, and into the othermost parts of the world. So Acts 1.8 is an important verse. And that, the other one I mentioned was last week was Acts 2.42, and it talked about how the, uh, the church was formed that Pentecost day, and it says these were the important things they do, and um, I obviously don't have them memorized, but I've got the four things down, but I, I want to read it exactly. It says, and they were continually, this is the first church, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, which means doctrine or learning or, you know, exegesis, whatever, to teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. So breaking of bread was communion, we think, as well as uh, maybe uh, uh, bolstering the fellowship. And the fellowship was, of course, um, what we do between services. So if you're coming to church, I'd encourage you, you know, if you come to the second service, 11 o'clock, show up at 1030. Talk to some people, you know, have a, a cup of coffee or whatever. If you, uh, you know, for those in the first service, uh, stay along and, you know, join with each other because fellowship is important. I also want to throw out one other thing here. Uh, we've talked about some of the young moms we have and got Teresa coming on. Um, we'd love these kids to have a nursery during first service. We've had it, but we've lost one or two attendants during first service. So if some of you folks would say, you know what, I'm willing to be the attendant at nursery during the first service, and I'll come to second service, as you obviously normally do, um, then that would be a great help. So if you're, um, if you're interested in helping out with so these kids can come and their parents can minister, I know uh, some of them teach Sunday school classes and they have other things going on in the first service so they can't be in both. So it's nice to have somebody to take their, their children, the real littlest ones, and they're just great. So if you would like to come and help at first service, please let me know. I'll steer you in the right direction. But that's a great ministry uh, that we can have. So um, and fellowship is important.
important. So we're going to look today at uh, chapter uh, 4, and Adam's go, I've asked him to play it again, so instead of me just reading it, you can actually have the text. So as this uh, place is, as the uh, portion of the Word of God's Word is uh, read, it's going to be actually the actual verses, and you'll see in the bottom, you can just follow right along, but it gives a little bit of action, a little bit of perspective on it. So go ahead, Adam, if you would, please. And proclaim... It's touchy to get to the exact right spot, so. Acts is also a book of firsts, and today as we look at this text, you'll find a first, the first persecution that takes place. It's kind of interesting, if you remember last week, uh, as it brings it up. If you remember last week, we were actually, um, we were, it was the story of who? Last week was the story of who got healed? Layman, okay? We finish that up and we think, oh, thing, every, everything's hunky-dory, right? Not so. Here we come to, the, uh, to this particular thing and we find the layman saga continues. From your wicked ways. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, shown to a cripple, and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you, and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Okay. So ordered. So as, you, as we look at this passage today, it's interesting. They, they didn't want these men preaching the Word of God. And they didn't know what to do. So they did the best thing they could right off the stop them right off, and they arrested them. And since it was later in the day, they just put them in jail overnight. So these guys spent their first night in jail, Peter and John. And this would be the first time. But we'll take a look at this, if you will. And I was looking through this passage and really couldn't break it down in a nice three little sections or anything. So um, if you want to report me to the sermon police, you can. Today we got seven points, okay? Uh, not really points, but seven sections as we go through this story together to note what's taking place. So the first one I call it offended by the truth. These Jewish leaders thought they had finished off this problem. A couple of weeks before, what they just done? Crucified Jesus. They thought, this is the end. We got rid of this guy. No more, no more problems. And all of a sudden, these two guys show up, and they start, they, they heal a lame man, and they start preaching. And so they've got a major problem on their hands. So it says, um, being greatly disturbed, verse 2, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So there were two problems. What were the two problems? First one was what? They were teaching, okay, teaching. And what's the second thing? Right. They, were, they were preaching the resurrection. So we got two problems. So what we have here is really um, the, the, the Sadducees, who are the main group that had them arrested, okay, they are upset because these guys are teaching in the temple. Why? They don't have the credentials. The credentials are, you know, I mean, you've got to be a priest, you've got to have, a, you know, go to 
some seminary, you know, get your degree and everything. These guys were uneducated guys that nobody knew, you know. Why are they there preaching? Um, back in the, I was with Caleb for a little bit this week because uh, for just a few hours yesterday as we traded cars because of the, uh, Lois being up in um, Massachusetts at the hospital. But as we were driving down, we were talking about it. We got into some sort of conversation about this. And I said, you know, you really don't need a degree to preach, Okay. You don't need a degree to preach. Now, it's nice to have a degree. It's nice to have the education. I value the education. I've gone as far as I can, okay, and that to the highest level, and, that's, and it's important to do that, but you don't need that to be able to preach. Down in the South, they have what they call preacher boys, you know, and they even talk faster than I do, I'm told, <laughs> okay? My wife heard of them once. Yes, yeah, that's possible, Carmina. <laughs> and at uh, any rate, uh, yeah, this is the, this is the place of the 50-minute of the sermon in 35 minutes. But at any rate, uh, they, they go, but they would, they, right out of high school, they'll be start preaching, you know? Now, some of them go on a seminar, and they should, and I think seminary is valuable, but that was the problem. These guys, they shouldn't be teaching. We're the teachers. We're the high priests. They were mad at them. That was the first problem. The second issue uh, was that these guys were Sadducees. If you look in there, it says they were, they, um, verse first, there were Sadducees came upon them. Sadducees were kind of a higher group. They were um, more wealthy. Um, what we don't see here is the other group, which we often saw attacking Jesus, and that was the what? Pharisees. Where are the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees aren't complaining as much. The Sadducees were the ones that mostly got the Sanhedrin. They, con they uh, controlled the um, high priesthood, you know, and so forth. They were the, the more wealthy ones. And the key was they did not believe in the resurrection. Okay? So if, if you had, um, and, and I'm not talking political now, I'm talking theological. You have theological conservatives and theological Liberals, the theological liberals, eh, maybe the Bible's true, maybe it's not, you know, and they take this kind of thing. And obviously in the Old Testament it talks about the second, the, the, uh, you know, life after death and so forth. Sadducees, the liberals, they didn't believe it. Pharisees did. If I was living in that day, I probably would have been a Pharisee. Now hopefully I wouldn't be as legalistic as the Pharisees were, okay? Uh, and we have even Baptists today. They're going to be very, very legalistic, you know, i got to do this. And, and they go beyond what the Word of God teaches. We, we, we what the Bible teaches, but it's, it's possible to get legalistic, which what the Pharisees did. That was the problem. But they believe the Bible. They follow the scriptures. Sadducees, eh, not so much. And so they didn't believe in the resurrection, and that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> so if you're probably remembering the two, Pharisees or Sadducees, which one didn't believe in the resurrection, you know, which one the Pharisees, Sadducees were because they were sad, you see. So the problem was, not only were they preaching and teaching, and they shouldn't have been preaching and teaching, but they were preaching the resurrection. They said, this guy resurrected. Well, if Jesus resurrected from the dead, then what means? What's that mean? Their teaching's falling apart. It's wrong. It's false. So they couldn't hate that. So immediately, the rest of the guys, you know, that was their first reaction. As you look at the second thing we have coming down here in the second section, I put that in verses 3 and 4, I call it oppressed by the intolerant. They were intolerant of anybody else that would say anybody could be a Christian, you know, or anybody could believe in the resurrection or the Messiah had come. They had one kind of way, and that was the way you believed, okay? And they were very intolerant of others. And if you look in this section here in verse 3 and 4, it says, and they put them in jail until the next day, but many of those who had heard the message believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Now how many got saved at Pentecost? Well there were 120 who were believers in the upper room but how many got saved at the Pentecost after that? You remember? 3,000. Very good. 3,000 got saved. Now the total men at this point is up to 5,000. So that means how many got saved at the second sermon? 2,000. So we had 2,000 converts. So you can imagine 2,000 converts these Sadducees are pretty Sad, you see. <laughs> Pretty upset, you know? And so they, they want to see these guys put in jail. And they're very, you know, they had to believe what they believed. Now, uh, I put up these two signs, and, you know, uh, they can be used in two different ways, I guess. And I don't want to judge anybody who puts them up. I mean, it, they, there's obviously things we want to do and we're trying to say. And, um, you know, there's, a, there's the idea of being, of what we have today is pluralism. Everybody being able to practice their faith beside each other and not getting offended by the fact that somebody else practices their faith differently, okay? That's what's called pluralism, and that's what we have in the military and so forth that we should have, and sometimes we go the wrong direction on that. But it's the, it's the idea that everybody has the ability to practice what they believe and to preach it and teach it. They didn't think so. Put them in jail. 
They can't preach the resurrection of Jesus. Now, we'll, that'll show up a little bit further along as we go through the text of today and look at how things work out with these guys. So let's go on to the, to the uh, third section. And, and a, lot of problems, a lot of times the problems when this particular, you know, intolerant thing is, you know, um, be tolerant of us, but we won't be tolerant of you, you know. That comes through sometimes, and that's not what we want. So the third thing that we have is verses 6 and 7 as we look at that. So in verses um, 3 and 4, we have the, um, them uh, oppressed by the intolerant. Verse 5, it says, And it came about the next day that the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, that Ananias, the Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. So basically, this was the Sadducees, the upper echelon. Annas was the former high priest. He got deposed by Rome because they didn't like him. But he kept... He keeps on peering up because his family took control of the high priesthood. So his five sons all served as high priest at one time or another, and Caiaphas was a son-in-law. He served as the high priest. So when your son-in-law or your or your son's sitting, hey, dad, come along. You know. So even though he wasn't high priest, he carried a lot of weight, and you see him in all these different uh, different episodes that we have here. And in fact, the talk gives two of his sons' names here, John and Alexander. So all the high priestly people were there, and they kept the guys overnight, then bring them before them. And it says in verse 7, when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now, I've learned sometimes, don't ask a question that you don't want the answer to. Okay. Don't ask a question. And that's what these guys. So the third point is question by the powerful. Um, they ask the question, we have the authority, we're the powerful, by what power or by what name do you do this? So they were asking the question, by what power? We have the power. We want to know what power you have. Now, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a, a bad for them because they've got the, the knowledge of power, but who had the physical power? Peter and John, they handled, they, 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 you know, layman of these guys couldn't do it. So as we look at the third point, and we get on to the next, we, we look at question by the powerful, it was a dumb question. So it, it says, we want to answer. We need an answer. And so they gave him an opening. If you go to court, and this was a court trial, and you ask someone a question, you've got to give them a chance to answer. So we're going to go through the four points. So Adam, if you can go to the fourth point here, we're going to be, it's empowered by the Spirit. Um, if you are interested in reading sometimes First and Second Peter, the epistles, you'll see some of these experiences we've talked about coming out. They'll show up, in, I think, in what Peter says. He talks a lot about stones, okay? Because his name is, you will be Peter, and upon this rock I will build a church. So stones, he's kind of enamored by stones. You'll see that in this text also in a little bit. Numbered by stone. That comes out in his epistles. Another one that he comes out of those epistles that I think is really important is, and I have this underlined in my Bible, it's 1 Peter 3.15. It's one that I think is so critical for us to know. He says this, Sanctify or set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give an answer or a defense, or the word is actually apologia, uh, an apologetic for the, for the uh, cause that you have in, or the account that you have or the hope that you have in Jesus Christ yet with gentleness and reverence. So he was going to he actually practiced that here. He's not going to you know lay him down and, and be really loud and boisterous with gentleness and reverence. He's going to say I realize where you are but I'm going to be giving him giving an answer. This applies to if you're at work and someone asks you how come you seem to be always here on time and everybody else isn't? How come you always are conscious about how the breaks you take in school? How come you always do your homework, you know? I mean, what, what's this with you? I mean, everybody else, they don't care. Be ready to give a defense of your faith. We always need to be, and Peter realized that because this is where it takes place. And if, in fact, if you if you look in some of the in uh, Matthew chapter ten verses nineteen and twenty, you might have to write these down. I'm not going to read them for you. Matthew ten nineteen and twenty, and Luke twenty one fifteen. Jesus Christ says, "Someday you will stand before judges and other government officials, and you'll need to give an account. Don't worry about it. At that time, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say." This is Peter being able a chance to put that into practice. Here he is. 
So he puts it into practice. So in this section, there are four things that come out in this verses 8 through uh, 12 or 7 through 12 here that I want to refer you to. Verse uh, 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people. So the first thing I note is the source of his, of his speech, the source of his sermon is the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the second time, at least, that we hear in the scriptures about him being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? If you, if, you re, if you concentrate wrongly in chapter 2, you'll think it's to speak in tongues. But that's not why. What does he say in chapter 1, verse 8? You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit comes on us, not so we can speak in tongues and do more. I mean, that's how they authenticated the gospel. He comes on us to give us God's power in our lives. The power to witness, the power to preach, the power to serve God. So we need to have the Holy Spirit, and He is living in our lives. His job is to give us the power to be able to do things. So it says the first thing He hears, He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter filled with the Spirit, verse 9. And I, I like this in verse 9. He kind of twisted on him. If we're in trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as, a how, as how this man has been made well, then I'll give you the answer. So they want to concentrate what's the power? What's the name? They want to jump down their throats. And he kind of turns it on them. He says, here's the man standing here. If you're asking us how this guy got healed, let me tell you. Well, they, don't, they want to ignore this guy. That wasn't what they want. They don't want people, they want to take the focus off of that guy. They didn't want him as a, as a, as a first-class exhibit in this court trial, but he was. And so they said, if you're talking about how this man was healed, let me tell you the story. The second thing, it's the name Jesus, verse 10. Let it be known to you all. And he, so he gets, I think, kind of very, you know, let it be known to you all. And to the people of Israel, this is where he turned around on the film, you know, and uh, talked to the rest of the crowd standing there. Um, whom you crucified, this man was um, healed by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead. Now, this is really sticking in the, the, the Sadducees gall. They've, they already, they wanted to shut this guy down because he was teaching the people about the resurrection. Here he is. They asked him a question. What's this guy do? He brings the resurrection right back into his answer. You murdered the Messiah. And then he resurrected from the dead. And they're saying, what do we do? Should never ask that question. Dumb. By his name, this man stands here before you in good health. It's the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. We've got to get that down. Too many times we don't focus on the name of Jesus. These guys were witnesses. They'll say later on, they cannot stop saying what they have seen and heard. Because what? They were witnesses that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And Sadducees, if you don't believe me, he rose from the dead. This guy's standing here. He's standing here because we healed him based on Jesus the Christ who rose from the dead. These guys are going bananas. Verse 11, he goes a little further. He, Jesus Christ, is the stone. Remember I told you he likes stones? Okay, he's a rock. He's a little stone. He, Jesus Christ, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. Now, you have to go back and know a little bit of history um, or, or legend of Israel to understand this. There's a story that when they were building the temple back in the days of Solomon, which took seven years to do, they didn't need chisels and saws and hammers and all that kind of stuff. Um, they, they shaped the stones in a quarry and then took them to the site and placed them, and they all fit perfectly where they belonged. Exactly. One day, as the legend goes, a stone came up, and it didn't fit any place. And they couldn't figure out where it went. And after a lot of trauma and everything else, they finally said, somebody made a mistake down there. <laughs> they set this thing up. It doesn't, it doesn't go in this place. I don't know what was they were thinking. And they took it over to the, which was right next to it, the Valley of Kidron. They rolled it down into the Valley of Kidron. The Kidron valley was the garbage dump that's the way they did it in the Middle East I was over in Kosovo you know I get upset when people throw litter down I, I, mo I really get super upset when I see cigarette butts down it's like they're not trash I'm sorry that's just a personal thing but anyway I, you know that's trash you know but trash goes over when I was in Kosovo 
the idea was they threw all the trash in the local riverbed. So there's this nice little riverbed going through this little town, and it's just filled with trash all over the place. And I thought, boy, this place, is, and, and it was beautiful countryside, but it was filled with trash. And that's what they did. The kid drawn was a valley, so they'd have trash, <laughs> throw it down into the, into the valley, into the, into the dump, the local dump. So they took the stone and rolled it down into the local dump. They finished the temple, so the story goes, got to the end, and all of a sudden, they can't find the stone that was the capstone, the corner capstone that goes on the top. Now, we sometimes call it a cornerstone, and it's put in the foundation. It supports the corner. Back then, it was the capstone that went on the top of the pinnacle, the top, going to hold the two walls together. They can't find it. Where to go? Some worker all of a sudden remembers, well, you know what? We did have one stone left over. Remember, we threw it down the hill. And they, they go down this humongous stone. They got to get, I don't know, a thousand guys. I don't know what it takes to take this. You can imagine with a stone. I mean, I have pictures of myself when I was in Israel when I was 17. I mean, some of these, I mean, one stone was like this high. I mean, these are massive rocks. They had to drag it all the way back up and put it in place. They had thrown away the capstone. The Jews, I believe in this time period, all knew that story. It was legend. And so he looks at them and he says, Jesus Christ is the stone which you guys rejected and threw down the hill into the garbage. It has been brought back and it is the capstone of Judaism. And I'm sure these guys are just remembering this. They're, uh, they're, they're just probably going bananas that he's actually even talking about this particular thing. The capstone, the building which the builders, re the stone which the builders rejected. Then in verse 12, this is the other verse that you should underline, you should memorize. Memorize as a little kid, and uh, it's, it's, it's such a well-versed verse. Verse 12, for there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name, Jesus. So he comes back to the name of Jesus. There's no other name. It's Jesus or not. If you, someone says, I don't want to choose Jesus. I just, I, you know, I'll delay it or whatever. If you don't choose Jesus, you choose to reject Jesus. You're like these guys who rejected the cornerstone. You only have two choices. And to, to not choose is to choose the other direction. So to not choose Jesus is to choose a godless eternity. You can't say, oh, I'll just decide sometime later. You never know if you have a later. And the scriptures say sometimes you get so close, and then if you reject it when you get that close, you'll never come. I mean, if you can't reject it here, how are you going to reject it later on? It's like, you know, a person says, I want a 4.0, or I want a, a 3.9 average. You know, I can get a little A's. Well, you know, if you get one, if you get, if you get a couple of B's or a couple of B mo A minuses, you can still make maybe a 4.9. But if you're close to a 4.9, and you don't do it, and then you start getting C's and D's, you're never going to get a 3.9. It's never going to come back up. And that's the way it is. If you get that close and reject it, you're not going to get it. And so he says, there's no other name. Absolute. And that's what a lot of people don't like about it, because they say it's an exclusive religion. And that's where this coexist kind of thing comes up. You know, some people say, you know, you can do some things, but you can't do others. You can't, uh, you can't follow on with the name of Jesus. Hinduism includes all faiths. You know, they kind of recognize everybody. Um, you get, um, you get to uh, some of the other faiths, and um, you know, society wants that open. It says, okay. I heard this last week. Uh, there was a um, some school. A mom got mad because her daughter didn't make the cheerleading squad. Did you hear that? And so they, so they decided that. They change the rules. Everybody makes the cheerleading squad. You know, so it's just going to, everybody's on. That's the new thing, you know. Don't offend anybody. You don't, lower your standards. Don't offend anybody. People don't like Christianity because it's exclusive faith. No other name. Jesus Christ said, I am the, I am the, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. They don't like that. A tragedy occurs in the United States. And what is the president saying? I'm not blaming President Trump or I was, I'm just saying any president or, or your leader or your town. I mean, if a tragedy takes place, what do they say? Pray for us. 
Somebody gets 9-11. Everybody's saying, pray for the victims. Pray for the families. You, get, you, have, you have a hurricane. Pray for the victims. You have a riot. Pray for the victims. You get a couple of policemen, like five policemen, and got shot in town. Pray for the policemen. Pray for the fire. All, pray for all these people. And yet Jesus' name is said a million times in America every day. And it's not in prayer. How many times have you heard people say, curse in the name of Jesus? Jesus, you know. But let someone end their prayer in Jesus' name, and all of a sudden, oh, you can't do that. You know? In the chaplaincy, we have to, um, have to uh, represent our endorsing agency. If you don't, the endorsing agency will pull your endorsement and you're out of the army as a chaplain because the cha army chaplaincy is based on the fact that we have various faiths in and we want to get as all these faiths represented in our chaplains so the chaplains can minister to those particular people. I'm a Baptist. I have to do what Baptist stuff does. I can't have a Catholic service. I can't do a Jewish service. But if there's a Jewish person, I provide for them. One of my best friends or still admires me, I've seen him uh, at these banquets I go to, was a Jewish first sergeant because I went to many Jewish services with him. When it came to the Sabbath, I would get him in my chaplain's vehicle. I'd drive him to the thing. I'd walk in, in fact, and, and I greatly respect the Jewish faith. I'd put on the yarmulke and walk in there, and I'd, I'd try to look up, remember my Hebrew and see if I could follow along as they were talking. But, you know, it was, it was, a, it was plurality. But, boy, if you, preach, if you say in Jesus' name outside, you're going to get in trouble. People don't like that. Praying God's name, praying the Father's name, it offends them. What does it say? No other name but Jesus. The, if, the, if, the, if the disciples had said, we healed this guy in God's name, would the Sadducees have been upset? No. What was the problem? The name Jesus. The name of Jesus. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus Christ said, broad is the way that leads to where? destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to heaven. Most of the people today, a lot of people like to say there's a, every, every road leads to heaven. There's lots of ways to get there. But that's not what the scriptures teach. It's based on the Jewish faith which said God is offended. You offer sacrifices and as someday the Messiah will come and he will pay Isaiah 53. He will pay the penalty, the sacrifice. verses 13 and 14. These guys were confused. They were speechless. Pretty hard to get a priest that's speechless, especially the Sanhedrin. But look at verse 13 and 14. After he said this, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. Remember, that was the problem. They didn't have the credentials. As they said that, they were marveling to recognize them as being with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. The guy's there, what are we going to say? The proof is right here. How are we going to deny it? These guys, when you go to work, do you have to wear a Jesus t-shirt or do people know that you've been with Jesus? We should reflect that. When we go to school, we go to work, we teach lessons, when we go with the friends, we're on Facebook, they should have to guess it should be obvious. When was the last time Peter saw these guys or was near them? The night of denial, remember? John got him in. He's sitting there around a fire denying Jesus with the Sadducee while the, while the Sanhedrin is meeting. Here he is. Now he's standing in front of the same place. And those guys are saying, this is the guy who was, you know, ready to, you know, was, was, was denying Jesus. Now he's standing behind, in front here talking. They're untrained. How can these guys possibly be doing this? They had been with Jesus. They noted that. And they bothered them. Verses 15 to 29, proclaimed by the preachers. This is, the, this is their sermon. And if you look through here, it says, it starts off when, um, verse 15, and when they had ordered them to go out, the council had a special session. They put, sent them out, and they had their little uh, private session. And so they decided in verse 17, but in order that it may not be spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to any man in this name. 
Verse 18. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They wanted them to stop because the name of Jesus was offensive. But they had been witnesses. In verse 19 and 20, they say, we can't stop because we've seen it and heard it. We just, we're, just, we're just being, you're calling us in this trial as a witness. We're just telling you what we saw and heard. That's what you want, right? And verses 22 to 31, they finally released them. They go to see the people. And in this section here, it says that they, they rejoiced that these guys got saved. They actually recorded the prayer. And I'm going to just go to the end part of it here. It starts in verse 29. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. That's the Sadducees' threats. And grant that thy bond servants may speak thy word with all confidence, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of thy holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Spirit. And they began to speak in tongues, right? No. They began to speak the Word of God with boldness. You see, the emphasis wasn't speaking on tongues or anything. The emphasis was bold witness for Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. I'm not ditching anybody else. I'm just saying we've got the right focus. And the focus is that there's power in the name of Jesus. They didn't pray that the persecution would stop. They didn't pray that Peter and John wouldn't get in, in jail again. They prayed, allow them to speak with confidence the word of God. If you look through this passage, it's fine. You see the name of Jesus constantly. Let me just, let me just close with this. Look at verse 7. I just want to, I want to show you how important the name of Jesus is to them. Verse 7, And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or name have you done this? Verse 10, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of, Ezra, of the Nazarene, whom you crucified, God has raised him from the dead, and by this name this man stands here. Verse 12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven. Verse 13, they were untrained men and they were marveling because they recognized them as being with Jesus. Verse 17, but in order that it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them not to speak any more in this name. Verse 18, and when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Do you think the name of Jesus is important? Our power is in the name of Jesus. When you have problems this week, things don't go right, where's your power? If someone at work gives you a hard time because you're a Christian, where's your power? If you wind up having a situation this week where you need God's help, where's your power? Dear Lord, we just pray that you might help us to keep our focus right. We, not, we might not focus on distractions and other things. And we might not expect that we're not going to get persecuted for what we are and who we are and what we believe. May we remember that while we may not be bashing other faiths, we don't intend to do that, we still need to be true to our value and we can't obey those who say, never speak the name of Jesus because you are our power. May we always put your name first. May we be powerful witnesses for you. And as we leave this place, may you give us strength in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand.